Hello, this is Jeannie Ives with Breakthrough Ideas. And today we are going to be talking about what's happening with evictions in the spotlight. Let's start first with this NBC5 report. It says, for almost a year now, Governor J.B. Pritzker's eviction moratorium has kept renters from losing their homes during the coronavirus pandemic. But the moratorium may be coming at a cost for smaller landlords with a single investment property. They just decided I couldn't do anything, and they were correct, said Robin Polanco, who recalled that five months into the moratorium, the renters living inside her Bartlett home suddenly decided to stop paying. Polanco claims the renters were employed the entire time and just taking advantage of the moratorium, even seeming to taunt her with text messages writing, I'll stay as long as Pritzker lets me. This has been a nightmare for landlords, and it's not going to be solved anytime soon. Also from an NPR article dated just a few days ago, it says the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has taken a key step toward extending an order aimed at preventing evictions during the ongoing COVID-19 outbreak. The CDC order is currently set to expire in less than two weeks. Housing advocates have warned for months that allowing this protection for renters to lapse would spark a tsunami of evictions putting upward of 1 million people out of their homes. The CDC has now sent a proposal to the Office of Management and Budget for regulatory review. The CDC hasn't responded to a request for comment, and the listing for the OMB site doesn't indicate how long the CDC might extend the eviction order for. Nearly 10 million Americans are behind on their rent payments, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. In the last two COVID relief bills, Congress has approved more than $50 billion for rental assistance. But we know that the rent assistance is not getting, apparently, to the landlords. And this has created a lot of problems for them. Here with me today is Jeff Myers. And Jeffrey Myers is an attorney with Klein, Stoddard, Buck, and Lewis, LLC. They are attorneys out of the DeKalb County. Uh, this is in the state of Illinois, if you're listening from other places. And he has had to deal directly with this when it comes to landlords losing their shirt, really, on some of the properties and for no reason at all. Jeff, could you start us out here with basically what you have seen developed in this law and how it has affected the people that you represent? Sure. Well, thank you. First, I uh, appreciate you having me on. It's always a pleasure to have an opportunity to have a conversation with you and talk to your supporters and listeners. Um, my practice does it, um, uh, encompass a, a broad array of things, but one of them is residential uh, uh, landlord-tenant issues, evictions. Uh, and for the last year, it's been incredibly difficult for my clients, um, principally on the landlord side, as they try to uh, address or adjust to the reality of having a number of tenants in default, not making their payments to uh, to the landlord, and then the landlord in turn trying to find a way to pay their mortgages, pay whatever financing they have that has allowed them to acquire their properties. Uh, and some of them have employees that work for them, and they still have to pay their employees who help them manage the properties or maintain the properties. It's been incredibly difficult for them. Uh, most of my clients are small business owners. They're they're uh, people who have you know one or two properties or sometimes several properties. But e even if they have several properties, you know um, that just you just multiply the the default rate by the number of properties. It's no less of a problem for them. They're all small business owners. This is not a situation where most of the people adversely affected are you know big corporate interests in Chicago who have you know 100 200 unit condo buildings. That that's not who this is adversely impacting on a very acute level. It's small business owners, people like you and me. Um, you know everyone from Folks who have a, a house that they kept here in Illinois when they moved out of state wonder why that happens, um, you know, and they're just have a tenant paying the the rent to them so they can pay the mortgage until they're able to sell the property. Right on up to people with several buildings, it's been incredibly difficult for them this year. So uh, you specifically had told me about a case where uh, some of that you are actually in litigation with uh, apparently uh, started the eviction notice yeah. even prior to COVID happening, and because. <laughs> They, there was like a short five day window where they happened to get caught up in the COVID eviction moratorium. They're not able to actually take those people out of the, the property and they haven't been paying. Absolutely. I, I, clients have a property where they had a, 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 a default, a failure to pay rent that I think started in January or February of 2020. So this is before anything related to COVID. No, no executive orders. It was still kind of in its nascent stage. No one really knew what was happening, but it certainly wasn't COVID related. These uh, tenants just stop paying their rent for whatever reason. We sent a five-day notice because you're required to do that. That's a prerequisite to filing an eviction case in Illinois. Tenants did not cure the defaults in that time period. We filed an eviction case. You know, 
really run of the mill. These are supposed to be expedited proceedings. It's an abbreviated process, very simplistic in a, in a procedural sense. Filed the case, uh, went, uh, sent a summons out to uh, have served on the tenants. They were served. And it was just between the time they were served with the lawsuit and the time that it actually made its way into a, a, for a first appearance in court that the COVID uh, situation arose. The governor issued this executive order that it effectively froze the process. But e even in that case, facially, the executive order was not supposed to apply to default previous mm -hmm. to COVID. But here we are uh, now in this case, almost 13 months later, and we still do not have an order for possession in the case. 13 months. And yeah. has your landlord, the landlord been paid anything in those 13 months? Not a penny. Not a penny. Not a penny. So what happened with all this rental assistance that happened with the first couple of COVID bills, about $50 billion worth? Right. Well, in that case, um, the courts were effectively closed until June. So um, you, you couldn't even get a court date. The court was just entering a, a series. But we're of nine months past that. Yeah. So the court reopens. We get back into court. It's like July or August. Um we get back in front of the judge and he says, well, you know, are you taking advantage of this rental assistance from the state of Illinois? And we said, well, we filed an application. We haven't heard anything. He said, well, you, you, under this program, you know, you're not allowed to continue an eviction case. You can't evict the tenant and get the relief. This was supposed to come up at the end. The tenancy was supposed to expire at the end of the year anyways. So we just, at that point, put the case into abeyance and applied for the rental assistance. It took months. The state finally comes back and says, nope, money's gone. Money's gone. The money's gone. Right. And so are you first in the list with this new $1.9 trillion to get additional rental assistance? Because additional rental assistance is in the new uh, you know, $2 trillion bill that just passed. I don't even think they've promulgated the rules yet for how you apply for it, at least not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, and, and uh, you know, at the same time, do you know anything like these tenants? It's not simply that the, these tenants themselves can actually apply for rental assistance. Yes. These tenants themselves can also are also applying for unemployment insurance if they did not have a job. Mm -hmm. These tenants themselves, themselves, in many cases, do have a job as it per the um, the earlier case that I cited uh, with Polanco. What, so what's, what's the, going, where's, where's the money going? What's the incentive? There's what, no incentive. What's That's the, the incentive point. for That's the tenant right. to apply for the rental assistance to pay the arrearage and try to reinstate the tenancy? What's the incentive? Right now, you even in a very limited set of circumstances, you can get an order for possession under the governor's executive orders. Good luck getting a sheriff to enforce it. Um, you know, they're very, first there are restrictions right. on enforcement, but they're also terrified, I think, of enforcing because they're worried that they're going to get caught up in an accusation that they're violating someone's rights by enforcing this order for possession against them. What's the incentive? They're living for free. Why would they apply just to serve as a conduit to turn the money over to the landlord when the landlord can't do anything about the default anyways? Well, the, you know, and this is uh, surprisingly not obviously uh, locality specific. This is happening throughout, even in Cook County. It, it appears that some judges are having a problem with the entire rental assistance program and the eviction uh, cases as well. I'm going to just read here briefly from the Chicago Reader. And it says it was close to 11 a.m. on Tuesday, January 5th, when Cook County Circuit Court Judge Martin Moltz said in open court that he thought Governor J.B. Pritzker's eviction moratorium is utter idiocy. According to an attorney representing a property owner, the eviction case before Moltz, which had been filed in October, was a post-foreclosure matter. The former owners who had lost their house had allegedly illegally re-entered it. The new owners, Kirkland Group, a Tennessee-based real estate investment firm, were trying to get an eviction order from the judge, but since this was a residential case, Moltz was bound by the moratorium. I understand they're squatters and they're owed no duty of any kind, Moltz told Kirkland's attendant, attorney Aaron Neville in a kind and sympathetic tone. He apologized that he couldn't order the eviction. In a case with squatters, we should be able to get them out right away. Neville was perplexed that the people couldn't be put out simply for the crime of breaking and entering. However, he had no evidence that they were engaged in any illegal or dangerous activity on the premises, something he'd need to prove for an emergency exception to the moratorium, which is what you were talking about. There are particular emergency yeah. exceptions to that moratorium, but you can literally break and enter your previous residence that you had already sold, apparently, and be a squatter, pay no rent, and they can't kick you out. The problem, one of the biggest problems with the governor's executive order is the manner in which it really is truly overly broad and doesn't take into account the particular nuances of specific cases. Um, you know, it's one thing to, to vest some discretion with a court and give them some guidelines, if that's even legal or constitutional, and I'm not conceding mm -hmm. that. But 
even if that were, these judges should have some discretion to take those particular facts into account and try to make it work under the broader parameters set forth by the governor. But here, it's very prescriptive. It says if the tenants are a threat to other tenants, if they're a threat to the property, then you're supposed to be able to proceed. But it's very, very narrow. And you still have to come in and establish that. You can't even proceed with the case until you first make that showing to the court. Um, the other One of the other exceptions is supposed to be if the tenants are willfully failing to pay their rent and are able to do so. This is new since December. Before, this didn't even matter if they were willfully failing to pay. Now, with the incarnations or the extension of the order since December, mm -hmm. if the tenant's willfully failing to pay, you're supposed to be able to proceed forward. But here's how this plays out. The landlord is required to give a self uh, a self stated or it's a form that you give to the tenant. They get to declare for themselves that they're unable to pay their rent because of whatever COVID they're taking care of somebody. Uh, and if they return that form to you, their self stated declaration with no support, no hearing, no evidence required, just if they return the form and sign it under oath saying I can't pay my rent, then you can't proceed forward. Um, in other circumstances, if they can pay, then they're supposed to try to pay something. Uh, no court has, to my knowledge, yet fleshed out exactly how much is enough. Is 10% enough? Is 20% enough? You know, can they move forward if they're paying 30%, but not if they're paying 60%? No one knows. Nobody knows. No one knows. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. I do some volunteer work with St. Vincent de Paul Society at my local church. And uh, part, of, part of what we do is we provide rental assistance for people in need. So I've taken on a few of these cases over the last few months of people needing rental assistance. And believe it or not, even among those, um, uh, you know, um, um, generous um, uh, not-for-profits that want to help people in need, they actually have received additional COVID relief money to help renters pay their rent. So there's other avenues of, of you know, that renters who are in trouble can approach uh, other housing um, uh, not-for-profits that want to do the right thing and keep people in their homes. Uh, and if they're not availing them to every uh, uh, available asset to actually pay their rent, you got to wonder if this system, this gamesmanship is, is you know, ever going to solve itself. I think it comes back to what we were talking about in terms of an incentive. What's the incentive? Right. But right. even beyond that, there, mm -hmm. there are some folks who have been caught up in this, probably with circumstances to a large degree outside of their control. But where do they go to even find this out? I mean, this is one of my practice areas, and it's hard for me to stay on top of what the, they keep changing. Every extension right. of the order, there's a new incarnation or nuance or the rules have changed. It's hard for me to stay on top of it, let alone, uh, you know, a, 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 your run-of-the-mill tenant. Right. Where, where are the resources? Where's the information on the resources? Um, you know, how do you apply for the program? Are, and why are the programs so cumbersome and take so long? I don't know, but they're awfully, they're awfully generous. Yeah. Uh, again, here is, I'm reading about uh, the extension of the moratorium. Um, in Illinois, and it says that, you know, J.B. Pritzker's administration extended a version of the statewide ban on residential evictions until April 3rd. Uh, the reprieve, it says, is welcomed by certain Illinois renters facing severe financial shortfalls due to economic displacements. By the way, I, I really do have to question some of that. Mm -hmm. Severe financial shortfalls. We have plussed up unemployment. Mm -hmm. We have provided uh, all sorts of other uh, plussed up uh, food stamps and um food stamps for kids and Extra tax credits and $1,400 here and $2,000, $2,400 there, for, you know, on and on of federal payments to people. So you do got to wonder about this. But a covered person who is, uh, you know, uh, let's see, the November eviction moratorium provided protection only to those tenants or residents that are covered persons. A covered person is one who meets all the following four metrics. The individual expects to earn no more than 99000 or 198,000 if filing a joint return. Okay, yeah. I mean, seriously, I mean, <laughs> that's a lot of money and yeah. they they would be considered able to I, unless you got a $4,000 a a month uh, condo downtown Chicago. I, but the, again, this is a public policy problem in Illinois generally is the, these rules and guidelines tend to kind of, you know, um, they really fit the world of Chicago. Of course, all of our policymakers are from there. So at least the ones that have any import. Or I don't care. In yeah. Chicago, yeah. that is a very no, generous yeah. salary to be able to afford your own my, my, my point is that it's even more ridiculous it once is. you get outside the city. And, and they are. That's an incredibly large amount of money to be bringing home and mm -hmm. to still make the case that you can't pay your rent to your small business owner landlord. 
I don't know if you're aware of this, but this also is another bill that's just been filed um, by State Rep uh, Ramirez out of Chicago, of course. She reintroduced a bill that um, would offer emergency support to tenants, landlords, and homeowners struggling. House Bill 2877, known as the Federal Emergency Rental Assistance Act. It creates a process for allocating funding for rental support that was made available in the federal stimulus package. Um, it also would expand the sealing of eviction records in the state through July of 2022. What do you think about that, lawyer? Uh, I think it makes it very difficult for a future landlord to be able to judge the creditworthiness of their prospective tenant. That's precisely what it does. That is exactly it does. What it, does. it hides. <laughs> it hides who was scam in the entire rental system. Uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. again, this isn't to say that we shouldn't have some sensitivity or concern for people who are caught up in things outside their right. control. I mean, the governor shut down businesses and people lost their jobs. They didn't have any say in that. But we're well past, I think, the point at which most of the, the individuals in these situations um, are, are really suffering from something that was outside of their control. Now we're in the neighborhood of people willfully failing to, to even make good faith efforts towards trying to pay for their housing expenses, you know, in a house owned by a small business owner or a family or something, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, this idea that we're going to hide the ball into the future because we're, we're focused on protecting tenants as opposed to protecting small business owners is is. You know, uh, it just doesn't it, it, seem balanced. I think that's the problem about it. I think that the, the eviction moratorium goes too far at this point. It was maybe obviously necessary at the very beginning, and there was funds to, to do that. It doesn't feel like the funds got to the landlords. It feels like the entire process was not well thought out mm -hmm. and not balanced. Yep. It just it just, just doesn't seem fair to both sides. Not, and I think that's not the at problem. all. I mean, where is the consideration for the fact that these um, landlords still have to pay real estate taxes? They have to pay their insurance. They have to maintain their properties. They have to maintain their code compliance. They could be sued if they, they didn't maintain their properties, yes, they couldn't they? Absolutely could. There's no moratorium on that. There's, so, no, right. absolutely so, not. So, uh, you know, your your tenant's not paying uh, rent, and then all of a sudden the toilet stops up, probably to the fault of the tenant, who knows, and they have to come in and do the repairs. Otherwise, they can be sued for not maintaining. Absolutely. Or face that, penalties from or municipal face penalties. authorities. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, that bill, though, by the way, here's something else I'd like to note is, according to Deanne Mazaki, she cited concerns that the legislation does not require a written lease to apply for additional rental support, which she argue would lead to fraudulent claims. I, I suppose there's always the potential for fraud in situations. There are a lot of tenancies, though, in Illinois are established um, through oral leases. Uh, right. Yeah. You know, um, you know I, I would say that for most of my clients, a written lease is probably the norm, but that that's hardly universal. A, a lot of tenancies are just oral leases. You would think, though, when you're involving federal and state taxpayer money, that there would be some sort of legal agreement between uh, the lessor and the lessee. Well, an oral lease is still a legally binding contract. Okay. But um, I mean, I, I agree with you that there's there's certainly the potential for it's a greater potential for fraud if you don't require some written Well, even in our little not-for-profit St. Vincent de Paul, we require a written lease before we disperse any funds and we disperse them directly to the landlord. You you could, um, you know, even in an oral lease situation, you could require some attestation or a tournament letter or something from both the landlord and the tenant acknowledging the tenancy and the terms of the tenancy. That would at least evidence in writing what with the oral agreement. I think the, the taxpayers is. would appreciate that. I think that would be a reasonable requirement. Don't you think that's a reasonable requirement? But apparently it's not in this case, even a requirement. So, um, well, great. I mean, this is, I, I hope this has been an enlightening discussion. It's one of mer many um, areas of the COVID relief packages that few people know much about, but is really having a dramatic effect on some folks if they're a small landlord. Absolutely. Right. So, well, thank you a lot for having, uh, for being here in the spotlight about this topic. And uh, we hope to have you back soon. On thank you. Else. I'd love to come back. Great. Thank you. Yeah, we'll have to talk about election law next time. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us in the spotlight with Jeff Meyer, um, a member of Klein Stoddard Buck uh, LLC. Thank you. You bet.